the Lightning Network. This is honestly one of the most important pieces of the entire Bitcoin ecosystem because it's what enables the full vision of Bitcoin, not only as a store of value, but also for peer-to-peer -peer payments. I mean, this is what El Salvador is gonna use in their countrywide initiative to adopt Bitcoin. Not because they want to, but because they need to in order for it to work. So in this video, I'm gonna give an overview of the Lightning Network for those of you who haven't looked into it before, and I'll also share some of my biggest concerns about its future. Sound interesting to you? Then strap in my friend and let's dive right in. If you're wondering why we need the Lightning Network, boom, check out this chart right here. This shows the average Bitcoin transaction fee. And there's been several times in history when blocks were completely full. That means that we'd have to wait hours or days for our transactions to be processed. And worst of all, we'd be paying over $50 to miners for any transaction, even if we just want to send like $10 worth of Bitcoin. Honestly, that makes the base Bitcoin network unreliable and sometimes impossible for smaller payments. Now, one key aspect causing these problems is Bitcoin's block size, which is capped at one megabyte. That's pretty small if you think about it, right? That can't even fit one song in MP3 format. And this means that you can only squeeze a certain number of transactions into each block. And if your transaction isn't chosen, you'll have to wait until the miners finally get to yours. Now, there's been some updates like Segregated Witness or SegWit, that helps a little bit with some clever workarounds. But at some point, we just simply cannot process all the transactions on chain. The block size is too limited and it takes on average 10 minutes to confirm a block, which is too long to wait for certain use cases. This is why we had the civil war back in 2018, which led to Bitcoin Cash being created because some people wanted bigger blocks to process more transactions on chain, while others were opposed to that because A, it would break backwards compatibility and B, it would reduce decentralization because larger blocks makes it harder for normal people to run full nodes. That's why the fork happened and three years later, it looks like the market has spoken. BTC's approach of smaller blocks has won out. But here's the thing though, even though we're going with smaller blocks and for good reason too, something's gotta be done so that Bitcoin could be adopted on a large scale. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what the Lightning Network is for. It's actually a second layer solution, right? The Bitcoin blockchain is the layer one. It's for settlements. And the Lightning Network is built on top, so it's layer two. It's meant for payments. To use the Lightning Network, you and a peer open a payment channel by locking some Bitcoin in a smart contract. And then you guys can ping pong your Bitcoin around to each other as many times as you want without having to record it on the blockchain. Only the opening and closing of the channel are recorded. So the starting and ending balance are recorded on the Bitcoin ledger and all transactions in between are not. Here's the beauty though. You can open multiple channels with different people to form a network of payment channels between trusted peers. So you can route payments through different channels and get from person A to person B without them having a direct channel together. This is a really amazing diagram which demonstrates this concept beautifully. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here, but trust me, it's worth it because so many other videos I watch do not explain this properly. So the yellow beads you see represent the amount of Bitcoin that can be shifted around each payment channel. And the big black circles are lightning nodes which can relay payments across the network. You see the green circle, which is Alice, and the orange circle, which is Bob? Well, Bob does have a couple options for paths that his payment can take to reach Alice. And that path depends on how much he wants to send. Like for the bottommost route right here, the maximum capacity is three yellow beads. So if Bob wants to send four yellow beads, he has to take this upper route instead. On the other hand, if Alice wants to send Bob anything, she's completely out of luck. You see how she has four yellow beads on the topmost payment channel? She can send that over to the black node, but that black node has no beads that it can pass along in the other channels. And the other two black nodes aren't just gonna pass along beads for her unless she sends them some in the first place, right? Or else they'd just be paying for her for free. Now you might wonder why she can't just take some beads from one channel and shift it to the other. Well, you can't do that easily because remember, to open the channel, you gotta lock your Bitcoin in a smart contract. And to close the channel, you gotta send another transaction. So there's a lot of steps involved that you need to do to shift things over and it's probably not worth it. Anyways, I hope this diagram gives you a better understanding of how the Lightning Network operates 
Definitely let me know down in the comments below if you have any questions about this. But I wanna stress here that the Lightning Network is not a blockchain and does not have its own coin or token. It's simply a peer-to-peer -peer network running on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, which lets us send transactions off chain. And by the way, the tech that powers the Lightning Network are called multi-signature wallets or multi-sig and hashed time-locked contracts. I'm not gonna dive into those in this video, but definitely go read about them if you're curious. Now, what are some of the biggest advantages of using the Lightning Network? Well, of course, it lessens the load on the main blockchain and increases the overall transaction capacity. Like Bitcoin plus the Lightning Network could potentially process millions of transactions per second, even more than the mighty Visa or PayPal networks. And when using the Lightning Network, it drastically reduces fees for end users, with transactions being confirmed in seconds as opposed to the 10 minute average. It also increases privacy, more on this in a bit, and maintains decent security because all the Bitcoin is anchored to the base chain. And lastly, it's interoperable with other blockchains via something called atomic swaps. Here's the thing though, Lightning Network is mainly for peer-to-peer -peer payments, of course, but it can do so much more. Like you can use it with video games for in-game payments. And there's actually quite a few games that are doing this. I'm kind of surprised about this. You can also send messages and chat using Lightning. It doesn't need to be just for sending money. You could also run a new type of web shop that's peer-to-peer -peer and uses Lightning or even issue tokens on the Lightning Network. Like there's really so much you can do here. And personally, I'm excited to see what comes out of it in the next few years because the Lightning Network has been evolving and maturing. It's not the same as it was a couple years ago. It's improved on multiple fronts. Like their capacity has reached 2,000 Bitcoins committed with over 13,000 active nodes and over 58,000 payment channels opened. Now the number of nodes has held pretty steady since 2020, but the number of payment channels has rocketed by 20,000 and the Bitcoin committed has also doubled in that same time span. So that's all very impressive and speaks to its maturation. It's not only capacity though, liquidity has also improved. Remember if Alice wants to send Bitcoin to Bob, but they aren't directly connected, they have to route their payment through intermediate channels. But that means that there needs to be sufficient liquidity throughout some path in order for the transaction to go through. In the early days, some payments would get rejected by the network because wallets couldn't find a route with enough liquidity. But now that the Lightning Network has much more locked volume, we see larger and larger payments go through. Which is cool, but remember, the Lightning Network is not meant for huge payments anyways. It's better to send those directly through the Bitcoin network because that's the most secure and just use Lightning as a payment solution with a small amount locked in that you can top up as you need. Now, the last thing that has improved is its privacy, which is awesome because Bitcoin itself is not too private, but the Lightning Network is. When you route a transaction to the network, an intermediate node does not know the initial sender nor the final recipient. It can only see who passed it to them and who they're supposed to send it to next. So that means only the two parties of a payment channel can see the transactions within it. And the network itself has no idea what's going on within each channel nor the path that the payments are taking. It's the originating wallet that has a map of the whole network and calculates the best path. But here's the thing though, have you heard of Taproot before? That was the Bitcoin upgrade that a lot of people were buzzing about. That's gonna make the Lightning Network even more private than it already is. Because before, a weak link was that when you open or close payment channels, you had to send a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. And that meant that everyone could see what you were up to. But Taproot made it so that these transactions look indistinguishable from regular transactions between two wallets. So that's plus one for privacy. Now, I'm not gonna lie, there's a lot to celebrate and the Lightning Network has come a long way. But, and there's a big but here, there are some issues I'm concerned about and wanna share with you. But before that, you're probably wondering how the heck do we even access and use the Lightning Network? Well, you need a wallet and there's a ton of options here. They mainly fall into three categories, custodial, non-custodial, and personal nodes. Custodials are simple, right? You just download the wallet and they take care of everything for you. But of course, it's not your keys and also they see the activity going on. Some examples are the popular Strike Wallet that El Salvador is partnering with and also Blue Wallet and Wallet of Satoshi. Then for your non-custodial wallets, you hold your own seed phrase, but you still connect to the node of the wallet provider. So they're taking care of liquidity and channel management and can see what's going on. Two examples of this are Phoenix Wallet and Breeze Wallet. And finally, of course, you can go all out and run your own Bitcoin Core and Lightning nodes 
and take care of everything by yourself. But you gotta be kind of tech savvy for this and pay for your own hardware in exchange for what this offers, which is maximum privacy and self-sovereignty. There are some one-click installations though, like Umbrel and MyNode, which makes your life a little bit easier here. So yeah, those are the options in a nutshell in case you wanna get started. And now it's time for my concerns. First is that the network may reach a maximum capacity of nodes one day, and that would be a problem because every wallet fetches the entire state of the network and then calculates a good route for their transaction. But if there's like millions of nodes and that would take forever to calculate, and then the final route might not even be valid anymore when it's done. Fortunately, we're nowhere near that level right now, but it does need to be solved eventually in some way, shape or form. Now, one solution to this problem is just to have super nodes that a lot of people connect to for a more efficient route. I mean, this makes things easy because they can open payment channels to a ton of people and also maintain a good amount of liquidity. So if Alice is trying to send to Bob and they know that Chris has a super node, then they can try to route through there. But the downside is that this makes the network much more centralized and the super nodes have too much power. We're kind of already seeing that these days with the Bitfinex Lightning node having over 650 channels with over 260 Bitcoin in total capacity. This makes things easier to use, of course, but in an ideal world, we prefer less centralization. Now, another more general hurdle is that the Lightning Network is still a work in progress. It's by no means a finished product. Like for example, they still utilize something called watchtowers to make sure that the nodes don't cheat each other. Because nodes are supposed to stay online 24 seven to make sure that the peers don't broadcast an incorrect channel state and steal their Bitcoin on the layer one blockchain. Watchtowers basically monitor the channels to make sure that no shenanigans happen even if a node goes offline. Sounds awesome, right? But at the end of the day, it is a third party service that essentially spies on users and reduces privacy. Now there is some work being done here to make these obsolete, but once again, it's not quite ready yet. Like I said, in general, it's a work in progress. So don't be surprised if there are bugs or vulnerabilities that pop up and cause some people to lose funds. So what I recommend is just stick to small amounts and don't go too crazy with it. Now don't go just yet because there's one huge side effect that may surprise you. And this has to do with the world of on-chain analysis. Basically that field looks at data from the Bitcoin blockchain and uses it to predict future price action. Like some things you can see if the miners and whales, what are they doing, right? Are they buying or selling? and are funds flowing into or out of exchanges. Things like that, which can give us a better picture of how supply and demand is shifting at any given time. But the problem here is that if a lot of user activity moves off of the base layer blockchain and onto the more private lightning network, then these techniques and metrics won't be as accurate anymore. I mean, don't take my word for it. Willy Woo himself brought this up as a future risk for his type of analysis. And by the way, if you're curious to learn more about on-chain analysis and why I'm such a huge fan of it, be sure to watch this video where I break it all down for you. Or you could watch this one where I break down El Salvador's Bitcoin adoption and what the legal tender law means for Bitcoin as a whole. Anyways, I'm Kevin from BFB. I hope to see you on the next one and cheers.